Uh, and with that, uh, over to you, Greg. Uh, start sharing your screen. Great. OK. Uh, yeah, let me set this up. Um, is that now? All right. And there we go. I think that works. I just get confirmation from somebody that they're seeing it, right? Yep, yeah. got it. That's good. Good. Okay. All right. So, um, so yeah. So I'm going to be talking about navigating in Northeast Pennsylvania. All right. And uh, yeah. So we'll get into a bit more of it. Um, but we are thinking about uh, specifically the U.S. nationals in Northeast Pennsylvania. That's why I think this is so particularly interesting. But let's uh, let's keep going. Okay, so yeah, navigating in Northeast PA. Ah, and I guess just to explain, I will be saying any PA for the most part. That's around here. That's that's generally how people say it, or NEPA. But I go meet any PA. So navigating in any PA. Okay, so first off, yeah, who am I? I I'm Greg Allsweed. Um, I got to move all of your faces over a little bit so I can see the whole screen for me. Hold on. So uh, I'm Greg Allsweed. I, I've been around for a while, as you can see from the picture on the left there. Uh, and it, I think we can probably recognize some people in the background too, but. Uh, I've been a U.S. senior team member since 2014. I went to um, two junior world championships and I've been to multiple walks, multiple World Cups. And uh, yeah, I've been competing for a while. I am the course designer for the middle distance at the 2024 U.S. National. So uh, that in itself makes me generally a fun dude because I'm course designing. I think that goes hand in hand. And uh it may go without saying, but yeah, uh, try not to ask me too many questions about the, uh, <laughs> the middle at the U.S. Nationals because it'll just be apparent on the map. That's always going to be the answer. Okay, uh, continuing on. So what's so special about NEPA? Um, and actually, so before we get into this slide, what I actually wanted to, to share is <clears throat> that on the call, we actually have somebody else who lives, well, we have two people who live in Northeast Pennsylvania. We have Sandy Phillibrown, who's a bit south of us here, but uh, we actually have someone else, uh, Danny Riley, who has just recently moved to Northeast Pennsylvania along with AJ Riley. Uh, those are both also, you. both of them are U.S. senior team members, and they've moved here with a view to make an elite training center here and really see how much all of us can improve. Uh, in, in our orienteering performances over the coming year. So uh, I'm gonna have Danny jump in for a few comments on some of the legs, cause he's also present on some of the legs, but I'll be leading this for the most part, but okay. So what is so special about Northeast Pennsylvania? What's so special about here? First off, there's surprisingly varied terrain. It's really easy when you're driving through on the interstate or just, you know, driving to some event. If you drive through the area, you see, look out in the forest and you see, you know, okay, it's all forest. It's just trees and trees and trees and it never ends, right? So it's easy to think that there's very little variety. And in terms of maybe the vegetation, that's true. The, the vegetation is quite similar throughout the region. Uh, there are different forest types, but doesn't we know we don't have any desert terrain of course in this region right so what we do have is um for on in general along general lines for so we can talk about the natural variation which is glaciated terrain versus non-glaciated terrain uh actually i i think the it's the most recent border for glaciation it actually runs right through northeastern pennsylvania so i live in well scranton pennsylvania and we're about maybe 30, 40 miles north of that glacial border. And so it's quite easy to go south of it. And anybody who's familiar with that knows, no, familiar with glacial terrain knows that in glacial terrain, you get quite a few small differences, uh, subtle contour details, as you can see in the map on the lower left. Uh, and non-glaciated terrain is more like what you have on this map on the lower right. You have much more broad hillsides, really long, unweight, you know, 
that's maybe wavy, but not not really intricate contour detail. That tends to happen in glaciated terrain. And the really, and like I said, it's the, the amazing part of this is how close this terrain is. And it's so close that actually these two map samples on the bottom are from the same map. It's, that's Hickory Run. And on the right is the Goulds Run section, and on the left is the Sand Spring section. Uh, and it's actually the glacial border runs through that, that state park. It runs through Hickory Run. So that's how close the difference is. So that brings up lots of different navigational challenges when you have to run in a very vague, diffuse area, like on the lower right, and a very detailed, subtle, but detailed area, like on the lower left. So those are, it's a constant, constantly changing navigational challenges. And that's really beneficial to get to work on the different skills that you need to use in orienteering. And the next uh, thing that really sets NEPA apart in many ways from other parts of the country and even the world is our coal mine terrain. Uh, this is, uh, I think we, it is still the lar world's, largest world's largest deposit of anthracite coal. Even after everything that they, they took out over 80 something years that we still have more anthracite in the ground here than anywhere else. And thankfully it's staying down there for now. So, <laughs> but you can see examples of this terrain um, up in the upper right up here. This is a, a map we'll get into in a little bit. It's called Brownell. Um, this is man-made. This is not natural. This is something that, um, you know, pe this is people piled up. They, they dug up sections in one area and piled it up in another. And, uh, and it's, well, well, I'll get into it, but it's, it's quite steep. Um, and then the, the final thing that I think really makes um, the, the, oh, sorry, was there something in the chat there? Did I miss that? Uh, all I saw was new people joining. Okay, okay. Um, so the final thing that on this, on this slide that I wanted to touch on is that, you know, what makes this forest in, uh, in Northeast Pennsylvania so challenging is in summer it's due to low visibility because when the leaves are out, the visibility is cut down to about the same level as, as night orienteering. You know, you can usually, on a good day, you might, if, if in really wide open forest, you might be able to see 50 meters, but most of the time it's closer to 20 or 30 meters. Um, and then if anybody here has ever done night orienteering, I imagine many of you have, you understand why that low visibility is challenging. And in winter, when the leaves are down, you know, that, that visibility is higher. But we also do more night orienteering in winter. But also, with how subtle the far, how subtle the changes in the contours are, it, even if you can see very far in front of you, it quite often doesn't mean much to see very far because it's tough to make out the differences. But we're going to get into that. I want to let's see on the next slide. Yeah, yeah. So. On this, with this video, I'm going to, I'll play this in a second. I just want to, you know, I, I can show you all the maps in the world uh, all over, but until you actually get to see the terrain, it's really difficult to understand actually what you're looking at, right? Um, and uh, so we can, I'd like to show you this. This is from actually, I think 2020. I was doing a training session with a, a Latvian friend of mine who was here. And, uh, or we were putting out streamers. Sorry, that was it. Um, and he has the head cam that kind of goes off a little bit, but let's just get into it. Uh, play. Hold on. The, the runnability is decent, but with this many leaves out, it's really difficult to make out any meaning details. More like, as I said, more than 20, 30 meters out, around you. So you need to really be on your compass. And you need to feel the terrain, but we're going to look at that in a second. This is primarily American beach. That's most of what the forest is. And sometimes you can get these nice, beautifully open sections of hemlock but they are very short-lived <laughs> and you go right back into the uh, into the dense forest after that. It may not look all that dense from the video, but once you're out in the terrain, it, it feels quite different. 
There you go. All right. So, so now you've gotten to see. <laughs> now you've gotten to see what it, uh, what this terrain looks like. You know, actually there, not just not just looking at a map of it. Uh, can I go to the next one? Okay, am I stuck here? Hold on. Okay, I'd like to I'd like to go to the next. <laughs> uh, hold on, let's see if I can start this over. Okay. Okay. So just gonna okay. So got to see the terrain there. So that after getting to see that, now I want you to look at a map of that area of this section. So you actually have in your mind's eye kind of what the, the terrain looks like. You know, it's, as I said, it's quite different. And the leg that we're going to be considering right now is one to two. So this leg is actually from uh, the 2008 team trial, middle distance, the uh, M21 course, the blue course. And, uh, and we have the course setter on this call. That was Sandy Phillibrown. She did a great job with it. And, uh, and I believe we have, well, we have at least one, but I believe we probably have more than one person who, who ran this course, actually raced it when, uh, back in 2008. Uh, but I've used, I use this course now as my test course to kind of get to see where my physical and, and technical abilities are at different points throughout the season. But let's get to what I'm calling tip number one, which is... The thing is that the low vis hits hard, and that's low visibility. Okay. Now, why does low visibility hit hard? Well, the low visibility combined with the subtle feet contour features that means that you need to be taking even safer routes than you what you might think you need to take. Uh, relocating is an, is an extremely important skill in this type of terrain, but <laughs> I don't recommend relocating. The idea the ideal is to not have to relocate. <laughs> So that's where you take a route that is based on the idea of full speed, no mistakes. And for anybody who hasn't heard of that philosophy before, the full speed, no mistakes, it's, it's not about saying, okay, I'm going to run full speed and I won't make no mistakes. The idea is that you're choosing the route where, the route where you know you can run full speed and you will not make mistakes. That's the route that you're going to be most confident on. And it's when you're confident, when you know where you're going, it's a very, very special thing and you can run quite quickly. And then that last quote at the bottom there, I've got from my friend, uh, Timo Sild, an Estonian. You've, when he was running in Hickory Run, he just kept saying, you've got to feel the terrain. You know, you, you can't look out at it. You've just got to feel where you're going. I thought that was very almost you know, like philosophical. It's quite, quite a nice way to approach Hickory Run. Um, but, and, you know, and uh, so I imagine a lot of you have, while I've been going on my spiel here, a lot of you've been considering how you might try to do a leg like one to two. And again, as I said, you want to try to be as safe as possible because once you lose contact here, it's extremely difficult to make heads or tails of what's going on around you. And one of the main reasons for that is if you take a closer look, you'll see that many of these contours are actually form lines. So those form lines are important because things are definitely happening there. They are expressing important information in the terrain. But it's important to realize they're form lines because things are going to be much less steep than you might be expecting. So it's going to be a very gentle hill or a very, very gentle re-entrant. It might not be nearly, it might not be as obvious as what you might, as what you're looking for. But uh, recently, our elite training center here, the Electric City Orienteering Elite Training Center, did this course back in July as a test run. I have, I have the benefit of doing, having, having done this course multiple times, so I'll start with that. But uh, Danny, who was, as I said, also on the call, he did it, and I think he did not have as much fun 
as I did <laughs> going out there. So we can look here and see um, both of our roots here. You can see that I'm uh, blue, that's GA, 724 of July, 2024. And then Danny is in red, he is the DR, 724. Um, so you can, you can see I took three minutes and 13 seconds, Danny did 635 for that, obviously adding more distance and um, and, a and a slower pace because of his confusion. But um, uh, Danny, would you like to explain what happened to you on this leg, if you're there? I am here. Uh, first of all, why'd you have to choose this leg? <laughs> uh, I, I feel the need to, to save face here and say, uh, you know, this is, this is my first course back from injury, uh, uh, so on and <laughs> so forth, but to stay on topic, um, a large part of what made this so difficult was figuring out um, distance. So I had an idea in my head of how far I was running. And between the sort of indistinctness of the water features and the um, um, aggressiveness of the terrain, perhaps uh, holding me back or uh, maybe also not having the same fitness that I'm used to, uh, my sense of distance was totally warped and ended up being not reliable. And as soon as I saw that little lake where the beginning of the mistake is, that's where I thought the marsh was where um, Greg begins his attack into the control. Um, so from then I realized nothing made sense and turned into, you know, fight or flight <laughs> at that point, essentially. And uh, the only thing that I had to go off of to relocate was those vague water features but more importantly i eventually had greg to relocate off of. that's right yeah i did catch you towards the end that's right yes yeah. <laughs> well so, so okay thanks danny um so yeah so as he said you know it's you know he was going in he wasn't expecting the terrain to be as aggressive which i think is an accurate term for it uh you know, you, as you can see in the video, it looks, oh, the, you know, the ground looks fairly open. It looks fine. But once you get into the terrain, it's it's a different show and it can, it can slow you down and push you around in many different ways. Um, I see a question. I think I'm going to wait until uh, just one second until I finish this and I'll take some questions after this, this tip. Um, but for me on this leg, um, I knew that I wanted to do what I said before, the full speed, no mistakes which was picking out what I knew was going to be the most visible, easiest, the most visible features, the easiest ones to follow and just follow that. Because even after running this course many times, I've still made massive mistakes. So I know that I'm not immune to them. I know that I need to be very careful. So for me on this blue route, it was go over this slight, re this slight spur here and then come down on top of this hilltop, stay on top of the hilltop, top of the hilltop, hit the spur, stay on the spur, and see that marsh to my left and cross at this um, this stream crossing down here. And then from there, you're, you're, that's a good attack point. You just need to follow your compass and keep your head up. And also one thing I forgot to mention is that Sandy Philibrown, who set this course, also very kindly put out streamers for us for this, for this run. So that was very, again, very, very grateful for that. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, so is there is a hand up? Is there a question? Well, you want to put your hand up? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, hi, Greg. Um, thanks. I have a question. Did you have any consideration for the vegetation? Do you appear to have chose the greenest <laughs> possible route? Well, so part of it is... Um, well, green, so green one or light green here, I tend not to worry too much about in, in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, that's, I can still push through that fairly decently. What we're gonna get into the really, the stuff you really wanna avoid is the stuff up here to the, to the Northeast. But um, also the thing is that Hickory Run is showing its age a little bit and the vegetation has become a bit less reliable. So I try not to put too much weight on it the the white forest and the light green has changed quite a bit 
uh, still some, I'd say maybe like 60, 70% reliable, but um, I don't, for a map that's kind of this old, I don't use it to navigate off of. Um, I'll, I'll use the other features around me and just make, make everything work with the vegetation as best I can. Um, but that's a very good question. Thank you very much, because it leads into the uh, next thing. And I guess I, I should say that this Hickory Run probably needs a vegetation update, but it is a completely new map for the US Nationals. So that's not something that will need to be in your consideration there. But personally, I never, I don't worry about between light green and, and white forest too much. If I go through white, light green, all I need to remember is that the visibility is gonna be lower. That's the only thing I'm really worried about. But going into the next one, um, I wanted to talk about mountain laurel and how you should avoid it. Because uh, <laughs> uh, many people who have orienteered, who live in the Northeast or who, who have orienteered in the Northeast or just the East Coast in general, have gotten to experience the wonders of mountain laurel. And, um, and we know to avoid it. Um, but good course planners know how to force you into it anyway. So what I wanted to talk about is how do you approach it? Now, let me just make sure I can pull up this, this video here. Uh, yeah, there's right to it. So this is actually the same course. This, this is uh, the same course we've been talking about, uh, the 2008 men's team trials um, on this video. This, this time I did this one I think this was March of 2021 that I ran this time. So that's why there's no leaves out on the, the deciduous trees. But mountain laurel is a shrubby bush that never loses its leaves. So you can still see it perfectly well here. It actually stands out even better without, since every, there are no leaves on anything else. Um, and I'm going to explain after this video how you should approach it, but I'd just like to see, make sure that everybody gets to see what exactly you might be looking at. Uh, you can see some mountain laurel right here on the video right now. Uh, so let's see, uh, let's press play and see what else. We're gonna be running through a few patches of it here. See? Bushy plant. All right. Have to fight through it a little bit, but there's a small passage. More of it through here. All right. And then, and then going through here. And this mountain laurel looks to be thinning out quite a bit. Go right through that. Okay. So. I'll just interject here. Uh, I suppose the first video is obviously more representative of their... We should expect there still to be deciduous leaves on the trees in October, right? But they may have changed color by then. Hopefully they have changed into a beautiful array of, of different colors, yes. <laughs> I guess it's helpful that the mountain laurel will still be green. Yeah, the mountain laurel will be even easier to spot from a distance. Yeah, the mountain laurel is always green. <laughs> um, okay, so looking at, we're, so we're looking at that leg again from four to five. Yeah. Um, and just to remind you, I was just running through, what we saw was me running through here, along this hillside through, and then popping through down here and then, then running, continuing on down there. Um, so just to reiterate, everything looks a heck of a lot nicer in a video, but once you get out into, into the terrain and you have to start fighting through mountain laurel, you, you realize how it's not a good idea to fight through it. And uh, there was, so the first bullet point here for tip two that I wanted to touch on is that your race is lost if you just throw yourself into mountain laurel without a plan. I think many people here have probably done it before where they've just said, you know, I think I can just bust through there. It's not too bad on the other, it doesn't look too bad. I think I can see, you know, on the other side. And after about 20, 30 meters, you realize, okay, I'm stuck in this thing and I need to find a way. I don't, I can't move. I need to find a way out. So you can avoid that 
because mountain laurel is a really curious thing. It grows in extremely dense thickets. These really, really dense thickets. They're actually, they I think early, early Americans, settlers or pioneers, whatever you want to call them. They call them laurel hells, you know, the hell of laurel for good reason. But it, in these dense thickets, there's almost always corridors, these little passages of, of light green or white forest that you can follow through. And you can see that actually on, on four here. It's just underneath the line, but from four to five, you can see some, pass some of these passages going through the, the dark green. So those are what you wanna look for. And it takes a really, it's, a, it's really good navigational skill to find your, and navigate and find your way through there. Now, okay, so you've, you're, you're part way there. You can find the corridors on the map. Um, what's next? You actually have to find them in terrain. And that's the difficult part about mountain laurel. And it's something that drives mappers absolutely wild, absolutely mad. They, because you can look at mountain laurel from one direction and you move 10 meters to the right or 10 meters to the left and it looks completely different. So you might be staring at what you think is the corridor, the entrance to that corridor, the one you wanna take through to get your gold medal. And, one, and this has happened to me and it happened to me many times, I'm sure other people here too, but I've seen that's the corridor, that's the one I'm going for, go right into it and again, trapped and fighting my way through. It feels like I'm caught in a spider web and then you start to panic. It just all goes downhill from there. So how do you avoid that? Well, so you want to look for clear, reliable features before you enter, the, before you commit to the corridor. Um, in many cases, those are contours. Okay, there's, as I said before, there are many, many of these contours are very subtle, but they are there and you can use them. There are some of the most reliable, most visible features in many cases. So you always want to look for that before you, you commit to, that's the corridor that I'm looking for. Um, so I, I'll go back to the other screen so you can see it in a second. But for me, that, that, that reliable feature was this steep hillside. This steep hillside here along the stream and then this slight, you know, this elongated hill, of course I couldn't see the whole thing, but I could see the saddle and the hill. And then I knew that I was going into that passageway through here. I'll go back so you can see it without the, the route line. You can see steep hillside. It's diff I'm sorry, it's difficult to see with this resolution and the, the line covering it, but there's a passage there, there's a corridor, and then there's another down here. So those are the you know attack points or beacons. I've heard them called quite often in in European in Europe uh, for orienteering is looking for those really reliable high visibility features that you're going to be able to use before jumping into some dark green and possibly ruining your whole day. So it's um you know as a a friend of mine always used to tell me uh, he, he we called him the the king of the the vague controls that he said like. You know, anytime you go into dark green, you need to you need to have a very clear, reliable feature before you go in and when you leave. And you need to choose both of those features before you you're going in. So um, so that's that's uh, I just lost my train of thought because I saw Sandy's hand up. So that's what I'd like to touch on with with Mountain Laurel. What's, what's that, Sandy? You kept saying dark green. The mountain laurel is usually mapped as medium green, not dark green. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess sometimes it feels like I can't move at all. <laughs> um, okay. So otherwise you'll be stuck after three meters of fighting again. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're, we're good on time so far. So, uh, and the last tip that I wanted to talk on, uh, touch on today is uh, the what sets Northeast Pennsylvania apart as a really, really strange and unique place is the coal mine terrain. Um, anybody who has followed my attack point, I'm sure has seen me training in these areas. But again, I wanted to, uh, to share a video to show, you know, what it's actually like to be in this terrain. Uh, so let's go. Mm. 
Yeah. So it's five meter contours on this map in particular. Uh, and as, as I was saying before, it's just areas where they just dug up the ground and they've thrown it in another spot. So it's a whole bunch of rocks that the forest has, has come back on. But it's extremely steep. And that leads to a lot of interesting things in orienteering. There's nothing subtle, certainly, about this terrain. But it does have its own navigational challenges. <laughs> when I have to grab the trees to climb, you know it's it's quite steep. <laughs> It looks like, did I get it? I think I got it there, even if the GPS isn't showing it. All right, cool. Okay. So, so as I said first, much steeper than you might realize. These are five meter contours. And, um, you know, I didn't, you know, I don't have a scale on here, of course, and it wouldn't be wouldn't mean much anyway. But it's uh, this map I always it was made at one to seventy five hundred. So uh, to have the map made at one to seventy five hundred with five meter contours, you know, it's uh, you're doing some rock climbing out there. But what that means when you're running in steep terrain like this is kind of a bit of what happens in. Um, in Switzerland, for example, if you've if anybody has seen any long distance courses or anything from there, it me means that you sometimes will take some very unexpected routes, and the unexpected routes might end up being much much faster than than what you just look at the you know you look at the route, you look at the leg, you say, okay, really simple, I'm just you know can navigate through, but you need to look for runnability. And that's where the unexpected routes come in. You need to look for where you can actually move. Um, so we can see here, um, this was, so again, this is a course that Danny, AJ, and I actually did back in July also, actually. Uh, thankfully, you know, I'm still on top here because I'm the, uh, the expert of Northeast Pennsylvania orienteering. and it's not because they're recovering from injuries. That's definitely... That's not it. Um, but I mean, I could also, I remember we, all three of us have been running together up to this point, just getting into the terrain together. And then at number nine, we all split and ran separately. And I knew when I saw them go this way that they were gonna have too much climb going to nine. I'll go back to the, um, the other, the other leg here so you can see it without all the roots on it but it may not look like all that much to kind of go straight towards um you know this from nine to ten but when you remember that it's five meter contours and it's two and a half meter form lines you can see that the climb starts piling up very quickly and that you're going to be hitting some very very steep terrain very quickly uh, so that's how, that's why I did, if, as you'll see, you can see in the next one, that's why I took this route up around because I could see that, um, that it, it was going to be a bit flatter and I would actually have some, be able to run for a little bit there. And then all of us, as you can see, all of us went out of the coal mine terrain out into the normal pen, traditional Pennsylvania forest where we knew we would actually be able to run faster there. Um, I have another leg after this one, but is there anything you'd like to comment on this one, Danny? Especially these little um, features. No, I, I, I think you covered it. Um, nothing additional, no. Okay, well, hold on. Let's see for the next one, because I think that the next one was probably a little... Uh, yeah, so it's, all right. it's more interesting to see two, two legs say. together for this. Um, so again, 11, 12, 11 to 12, 12 to 13. 
I think you know everybody here gets to you get to look at the map, you get to choose your own routes, what you think might be the fastest, and then we're going to look at actually what was the fastest. I'll give everybody maybe let's say twenty more seconds, maybe let's see. <laughs> okay. Maybe you don't need to run it. I think there is a feature like to zoom in on a print if you're even like when you're in Google Meet if you if you want to do that. I think you can zoom in further on the map. I'm not sure everybody's got different operating systems and, and devices, so I'm not gonna get into how to do it, but I think there is a feature to do that if you need to. But all right, well, let's see. Let's see, at least between the three of us, between D Danny, AJ, and I, what ended up being the fastest. OK. So again, I got to be the champion on these two legs. Uh, I had the fastest time through here. AJ went through, around, and then came in. Yeah, lots of extra distance for AJ going in there. And then Danny went out, which is good. He's looking for runnability, but then had to climb right back up into it. And then came through, down, and then back into attacking it, where my plan again was to drop out, try to run through the normal forest, as I like to call it, <laughs> as much as possible. And then same thing, hit the trail, come along through the normal forest, and then come in on the, the clear re-entrant coming in. So again, unexpected routes, but the key principle, if you want to call it that, is looking for runnability, looking where you can actually move decently. And that's going to be move decently and reduce climb. And that's, in many cases, is going to be what the fastest option uh, is going to be. Um, as you can see, yeah, my, my per K time here was significantly faster than Danny and AJ's. And that's just because I was able to actually run. Moving in this terrain, as you got to see in the video, is not easy. It's, it's extremely rocky. Um, and and I think Danny has a really uh, fun story from this this downhill right right up here. From yeah, I think my hands have healed since then. But uh, uh, the, the path between 12 and 13, I think I was actually like hitting it pretty fast. You got to take what the forest gives you. And there's just this nice little ledge of runnability um, that I found until I hit that hill. Just uh, like Greg was saying, it was like just chunks of rocks essentially on the way down. And I got tripped up by like a branch or something like that. And yeah, fell clean on my hands. And because they're, you know, pointy rocks it started bleeding from my hands and it's just like that was just three contours just three contours but when i was on top of it i was like i i don't know if i can get down this <laughs> like, so and, and especially i don't know like if if you have difficulty running on on steep inclines this is like next level because the footing's odd like you might not be used to it it's like it's like running on sand dunes like it's it's just it, it's, it's impossible. Extremely rocky sand dunes. Yeah, but sand dunes that like hurt you. <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, Brownell is an extreme is in a, a very extreme example. Brownell the is this map, so th Brownell is such an extreme example that we are not crazy enough to to bring anybody out to to Brownell for a big event. We certainly wouldn't want. We're fine with you know you know masochism hurting ourselves that way, but we're not we're not fine with hurting anybody else that way. So. Coal mine terrain is a thing in Pennsylvania, but in Northeast Pennsylvania, but but Brownell is an extreme example of it. Uh, doesn't always get this this intense, but it's where you get to see the principles most clearly. So that's why I wanted to bring it up. So uh, so yeah, but that's ultimately there is a reason why we call it Rocksylvania here because well, the AT hikers call it Rocksylvania, where boots go to die, and there's a good reason for that. So. Uh, I think I've covered all the bases pretty decently here. So open it up. I don't want to take up any more time. So open it up to questions if anybody does have uh, anybody does have them. Uh, I assume you just saw what Adelia put in the chat. Is the uh, simplification right? 
Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. Um, it is. It is about simplification in in places like that. Um, it might be kind of a different sort of simplification because they're such large features. You know, you're not moving quickly in it. So, it, I when I think of simplification, I think of places I've run in the past, like in in sand dunes, where it's really intricate features, and you're going so quickly that you just cannot read all the details. Um, and then, and you know, as Danny was talking about trying to just move through this terrain, you go so slow that that's not exactly the same challenge. But I think it is still important because when you find the simple route, that's generally the fast route. It's generally the one where you're not going to be hitting all the contours, and you can you can make sense of things very quickly. Um, you know, you're not going to have to keep figuring out which big, which massive hill is that, which massive hill is that. You know, but but still looking for the same the same philosophy of full speed, no mistakes, picking the, the route that you know that you can run fast on and that you're not going to make mistakes. So if that in, involves simplification of saying, OK, I can follow this hillside and I know that I'm just there's going to be lots of bumps, but I'm just looking for that one big hill up to my left. And then I go in from there. That's a really great approach also. So, yeah, yeah, very useful. All right. Anything else? Yeah, C A. Yeah, hey, Greg, it's Matt. Hey. Um, so, given the variety of terrain in the area, are there variation? And and of course, map contacts are gonna always win. Mm -hmm. But are there variations in relocating tactics that work? better than others? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I mean, I suppose I, I, I'm not super well versed in different relocating tactics because I always think of it the same way. Um, I think it's relocating is about developing the sense of, mm -hmm. of being, you know, of confidence, you know, and, and recognizing when you're not confident. And then recognizing when you're making a mistake because you're not confident. Um, and I sit, and that's related to to relocating because <clears throat> if you can determine the point where you've lost confidence, you know where everything was making sense and then it wasn't, and you backtrack, you say, okay, you know, three minutes ago everything was perfect, you know, everything was golden, right? Or or even a minute ago things moved that quickly in orienteering, right? We'll say a minute. How much distance could you cover in a minute, right? Realistically, I mean, you're realistically in a in a minute. If things made sense a minute ago, you're not going to get to the other side of the map in a minute. So that gives you a a really small circle that you can relocate in. And if you know that you were more or less moving in the right direction, you can even make that circle even smaller, right? That search area. And then after that. It's um, for me, it's generally about just stopping again, recognizing that I what I'm not confident that as you know, determining where I did lose confidence and then looking around me for those visible features in the terrain and then going back to my search area on the map. So it goes terrain map in that case. So you say, OK, you know, what's around me? OK, well, I'm standing here and I can see that there's a re-entrant align north to south just in front of me here just north of me here where is the in that search area where is that um and in most cases that tends to work out pretty pretty quickly i think a lot a lot of people can also talk about bailing you know if that if none of that works out you can just bail to a trail uh or or another very visible feature where you knew you were but i my first approach, I suppose, in relocating is always that, is always think about where you were, mm -hmm. think about the distance that you could have covered in that time, and then find your area, determine what area you're going to be searching for on the map, look in the terrain, and then find it on the map. So that's... If I could jump in a, a little bit, uh, I made a really big mistake in the, the natural version of coal mining terrain uh, at the Canadian Championships in the Yukon, hmm. the Long Lake map. 
know, I lost contact crossing a vague contour area. When I got into the detailed stuff, I tried to figure out where I was. And I could have saved a lot of time by bailing out to the biggest contour feature a little bit left of the line up ahead of me earlier than I did. So, you know, if you can't quickly relocate in a detailed area, give up. <laughs> Go to somewhere where it will be easier to relocate without spending a lot of time on it is a good yeah. general rule. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's my approach to relocation, but I think everybody tends to have their different approaches to it. And, uh, or, you know, I've done what John is talking about too, but just knowing that it's something that you're going to need to really, you, I mean, ideally, you don't get into that situation, right? You take all the safe routes and you never put yourself in that situation. But if you do find yourself there, that's when you that's when you look at how to how to handle it. Right. So, Thanks. yeah, yeah. Anything else? No. Okay. Yeah, Danny, go ahead. Ask a question. Yeah, uh, why don't you show any routes where you were making mistakes and other people were, were beating you? Generally because, I don't think that, generally because that doesn't happen in North Oh, okay. yeah, That's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll post some examples. So. <laughs> Are you just going to post all the examples on your attack point? Is that... Yeah, yeah. it's, it's going to be cathartic. And I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll open with the picture of you as a kid. As well, well, just go ahead, go ahead and beat me at the Billy Goat, Danny. Go ahead and beat me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fair, fair play. <laughs> Right. I'm sure your mistakes are at least as educational as Danny's, Greg. Yeah. So. No, I do. I do make mistakes, but the things that came to mind first off for me, of course, were the ones that I was doing things right. Um, and actually, but Danny brings up a good point for that. Um, it's something that I I want to. I've been trying to do with Danny and AJ, but it's something that I think every orienteer really should do. Um, is that we all. Many people here, I imagine, are very used to um, going over their courses and finding their mistakes. You know, find, you know, saying, "Okay, so this is this went wrong. I lost time here," um, and then that's really valuable. That's one of the most important ways you can improve as an orienteer is to find those patterns and then see what mistakes you are continually making and and you know change that. But I think it's also really important to recognize and take time to look at the legs you think you ran really well. You know, that's how, the legs that you think, okay, this leg, this is how I want to be orienteering. Um, just from a psychological mind, uh, you know, standpoint, I think it's a really important thing to, to focus on what you want, where you want to be, rather than only focusing on what you keep not doing the way you want to. I think it's, you know, you, there are times that all of us had, I think can think about that was a good leg or that was a good course. So think about what, what that is and think about what went right in that, that made you feel that way. Um, and the reason I chose those examples was because I knew that those ones, I did what I wanted to do. I, I had the plan and I executed it. So, um, and thankfully Danny made mistakes on them. So I had somebody to contrast with. So. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so i mean just to to touch on that also i think it's a really important thing to balance that out and and to focus on the things that you do well not not just only on the mistakes all right okay uh if anyone else wants to jump in with questions you you'd better be quick uh i mean greg has a move to do so i'm sure he has stuff to do before he goes to bed Mm, no, thankfully now it's we'll just them if we don't have questions. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't hurt yourself lifting anything. Uh, I don't know if you can get your girlfriend to do all the heavy lifting, but oh, she's done most of it so far. Thankfully, <laughs> I've been I've been I've been I've been working way too much. But uh, yeah. oh, oh, uh, you wanna again? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, this is Penny. So um. I was wondering on like the um like the white and yellow courses, do you think that we'll have to do any of this kind of stuff? Or like a little bit or anything? I just I just wonder. I, I don't think I don't anticipate there's gonna be challenges quite that tough. I think you'll have other sorts of challenges, but maybe 
I don't think we'll be doing the sending you out down, <clears throat> sending you down the same hillsides as Danny. Danny, for example, I think you can be you can be sure you're going to be good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Uh, last chance. Anyone else? Going, going. Okay, gone. Thank you very much, Greg and uh, Danny as well. Yeah. And uh, you're welcome. See, yeah. uh, I assume I'll see everyone on this call in October in uh, an EPA. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Beautiful fall colors, hopefully. <laughs> Good Thank night, everyone. I'd like, right. I'd like to jump in and say one thing, and that right at the Tuesday after the uh, champs, we're going to have a, uh, um, a everyone gets a chance. I mean, we're going to have breakout rooms so that all the courses can do a course analysis on uh, on the same channel. Cool. There you go. I don't know if I'll be ready. I don't know if I'll be ready to jump in on that call. It might be too scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you. And good night. Thanks, Greg. Night. Night.